Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about behavioral health in the United States with guests Colleen Creighton, CEO of the American Association of Suicidology, uh, Chuck Ingoglia, uh, President and CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health, and Maureen O'Connor, President of the Palo Alto University. So thank you all for joining. Um, and I think we, we've, uh, we seem to have lost uh, Colleen for the moment, but hopefully she'll uh, get back on uh, soon. It, it's great to have you here. This is such an important time. We're all going through so much trauma through the pandemic, through the economic dislocation. There's so many anxieties here. And we took a look at, at the National Institutes of Health um, report and, and it's, it's pretty traumatic uh, what they report. They say 20% of adults here in the United States and worldwide live with uh, a, a mental illness. And that amounts to, to almost 50 million Americans, 47 million Americans to be precise. So I'd like to just start by talking about how you see this situation. Uh, Chuck, we'll start with you. Um, how, do you how do you see our coming to grips with this idea that, that health is not just about, you know, whether we have a broken arm or leg or whether we have a physical disease, but there is also this, um, this mental health dimension that is as important as the physical health dimension that we have. Yeah, well, Mark, that's a really great question. And, you know, uh, I think there's been a, a kind of a growing awareness in our country over the last few years that mental illnesses and addictions are real, that they're common and they're treatable. And if there is anything resembling a silver lining about COVID, um, you know, it would be that I think there's increased kind of recognition of this, this the discussion that is occurring about, uh, you know, people's well-being. I know even within our organization, you know, we had a, a discussion yesterday with supervisors uh, within our organization, and they've talked about how their whole kind of approach to supervision has changed, where the first question always now is, how are you? What's going on? And right. I think for so many of us, right, uh, because we're recognizing uh, that it's, we need to be paying attention to this. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think we're on a, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're on a uh, growing awareness and acceptance. So, in the growing awareness and acceptance, we also have organizations that have been on this track for a really long time. And Maureen, you are, I mean, you, your entire career arc has been about this idea of, of mental health, behavioral health. Could you just give us a quick outline of, of how, when you started your career, how, did, how was this field viewed then and how is it viewed today and how, how do you think it will be viewed going into the next several years where we're going to be dealing with this trauma for for a long time i'm happy to happy to be here thank you so much for uh, for pulling us all together to have this important conversation you know i think the uh, you're really getting at the issue of somewhat denial and somewhat stigma right and i think uh, certainly when i started my career i remember writing a paper on stigma uh back in the day and there were many many people at that time uh, many families for example who simply didn't talk about mental issues mental health issues in their family and people there was shame there was shame. I mean, I had it in my own family. Nobody talked about it. You know, you sort of just rid it up and went on. That was the New England way. Um, and, you know, I think that what's happened over time is particularly as we've had better and better data, better, better sources of, of information about how many people are, are dealing with this issue. You know, I think there are very few families, I'm just going to say bluntly, very few families who don't have some brushes with mental health or substance abuse uh, issues. So I think over time, frankly, the data and the science have really led us to be able to see this full scope of the issue. And I think that's helped. The other thing I wanna say is that, you know, as a university that trains mental health professionals, um, and I think does it quite well, if I do say so myself, you know, we, we have seen you know, increases in our enrollment this year because what I believe is also happening is that more and more young people really recognize these issues and want to do something about it. So on Chuck's sort of silver lining piece, 
I think we are seeing increasing numbers of people who want to go into this field, and that's because they both recognize it and are willing to talk about it. You're, you're so right. There is now, in a very good way, a casualness about how younger people talk about the importance of mental health. The, the idea of, of course, I've got some, some things that I need to deal with. Of course, my family does. And, and this idea of destigmatizing, right, and just making it an of, an of course aspect bring some healing. Colleen, I'm so glad you, uh, we were able to resolve the, diff the technical difficulties. Um, Sorry as, about that. As, as, you, as you look at, at the work of your organization, and you know, I love the name of the organization because it's right out there, the American Association of Suicidology, right? And we struggled with that name, to be honest, too. When we first started, um, you know, that was the study of the science, and that's what we were founded on. Um, now, as we're growing 50 years in, we're looking at, you know, a lot of people will say, what is that? And then you have to have that conversation. Oh, isn't that just suicide? Shouldn't you just change your name? Um, and one of the things that we're looking at here at AAS is talking about this cultural evolution of the, the topic and kind of making people more comfortable talking about the issue. It's kind of leaning into it and embracing the name, but also recognizing this field for the past 50 years has been a little bit exclusive. Um, there's a lot of voices that have not been included in the conversation. Um, typically, if you look at all the research and the data, um, it's been on maybe one segment of the population. And we're realizing now um, it's all ages, every demographic. We had one of our clinicians reach out and say she had a patient who was five years old. Um, so you're talking, I mean, literally pretty much every single group out there um, is struggling with this. And we need to bring their voices back in to have a fuller conversation. It's so interesting that, that you say that. We just completed a poll in which we were, mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out uh, where the, the uh, emphasis in people's minds are uh, in terms of uh, treatment needs. And uh, adolescents received a lot of focus, but we also received votes for every age category. Is, is this really a, a situation where um, it, it affects everybody regardless of gender, regardless of orientation, regardless of race, regardless of, of wealth, regardless, but there are accelerators, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're living at a, at a lower economic scale, you are likely to endure more, more trauma, which becomes an accelerator, right, Maureen? Absolutely, and I was just gonna say, it also exactly affects who, who can still talk about it. If you think of certain groups, so a lot of our students and, and faculty work with veterans, for example, that is not a group that is yet, you know, doing, you know, is not at open about those issues, right? And we see very high uh, suicide rates among uh, our veteran population. So there are still uh, groups that, that where this is not an open conversation. I really agree with Colleen and, and for whom uh, we have not uh, address the issues adequately. We're doing some work now in Santa Clara County, for example, with the, our wonderful uh, Professor Joyce Chu is working with the county on, on culturally competent suicide assessment techniques. We have not done particularly strong cultural competency assessment of suicidology, right? I think Colleen would say, you know, there's been some work on it, but it's still a newer part of the field and the, the older instruments and things may just not work for certain populations. So we have a lot of work still to do, for sure. And we all have uh, blind spots. Um, I had a, um, a discussion with my old boss, Gail Kong, um, who used to run the Child Welfare Administration City of New York. Uh, and she went on to run the Asian Pacific Fund. And she did a wonderful show with us on uh, some of the issues that, um, that uh, Asian elders experience, particularly uh, Asian women, and that it, it's sort of a silent scourge of, of trauma and despair um, as, as people age, in particular uh, uh, people who, who come from different cultures and feel uh, very alienated. We all have our blind spots, don't we, Chuck? I mean, when you're, when you're looking from a National Council perspective, how do you deal with, uh, with trying to ensure that there is awareness um, amongst different groups who might be aware of their own trauma or their group's trauma, even the leadership here, right? The leadership here, Maureen, Colleen, yourself, how do we try to ensure that our blind spots are dealt with in a systematic way? 
Yeah. So one of the, you know, so our organization represents about 3,400 clinics around the country that provide uh, mental health and addiction treatment. And one of the ways that, Mark, we have tried to focus on that over the last 10 years uh, is through this idea of creating trauma-informed uh, organizations. And so that the process of seeking help doesn't actually exacerbate the underlying condition. So how do we create uh, uh, everything from intake to the way the assessments are done to the way the treatment approach is, is put together uh, so that we create an atmosphere that's welcoming and accepting and doesn't re-traumatize. And then on top of that to, to, uh, is then also making sure that we have uh, for people who need it, trauma-specific interventions. Not everybody needs that, but some people do. Uh, but first of all, you want to create an environment where it's okay uh, to seek help, and in that process, you're not going to be uh, re uh, making things worse. So we have here um, direct services organizations. We have a, a cl information clearinghouse and kind of a coordinating body, and then in Palo Alto University, an educational institution. Could you talk a little bit about the fabric of, of the environment and how these different organizations interact together? Maureen, you were, you were talking about how early in your career you saw some data and you, and you published papers. Um, you also have a clinic. Um, you have some real thought leaders who are um, trying to push out new ideas into the field. Um, Chuck is a national counsel. Uh, Colleen, from her uh, stance, each, each organization is part of an interlocking puzzle piece. So let's start off with, with the academic uh, side and how you interact with, with the other elements of this uh, very complex puzzle. It's, a, it's really been on our minds uh, in this difficult, challenging time. Our students in mental health counseling and psychology train in 150 sites in our local community. Some of those sites are smaller mental health community mental health agencies, and they themselves are really struggling right now. So we are completely interdependent on our community and as being the, the location where a lot of the critical training goes on. As Chuck knows, that supervision, supervised in-person training is crucial. Now, of course, we have had to really uh, pivot and do an incredible amount of work to prepare ourselves and our clinic to be teletherapy uh, ready and not just to be able to technologically, you know, do teletherapy, but to really begin to understand what that modality means. And right? what its limits are, right? What its limits are. So working with our community partners, again, some of them just simply don't have the resources. And we have actually been working with them to make our resources, to try to share resources so that students can continue to get the clinical training they need. So we are really embedded in the community and that is what makes, I think, our training, that is why our training is so strong because we have such wonderful community partners. The other thing I just wanna mention quickly on the sort of evolving, you know, the academic side where we are, our, our faculty is very committed to engaged research. You know, we're not sitting in a lab doing research that isn't, isn't embedded in the community. And that what Chuck was saying really resonated with me because we don't, we don't now talk even about cultural competency, we talk about cultural humility, right? So our curriculum has had to evolve as we've had better understanding of, we don't go into a situation and we know what, what you need as a community. We actually have to ask the question, what can we bring to help you and how do, you, and how do we learn from you? So we are fully embedded in the community and that's the only way that our training is going to be uh, uh, top quality. We can't we can't do it by ourselves sitting up on a hill. <laughs> so, Colleen, could you could you just jump in and, and give us a sense of, of how you are responding to this, and in particular how you interact mm -hmm. as well with the academic side, which is developing the, these techniques, and and the national side. And, and I was just going to say, Maureen, we clearly need to work more closely. So we'll have to take this conversation <laughs> offline as well. Um, so a little bit what makes our organization AAS so unique is that we're membership based. So, but it's this really eclectic mix of um, the researchers, the academics. We have a journal related to this topic. So a lot of the research we're getting from our members that are bringing forward, but we also have the practical. So we have clinicians working in um, centers around the country. We have private practice. We have clinicians that are law survivors. 
We, but we, one of the things we do is we also accredit crisis centers around the country. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, Trevor Project, Veterans Crisis Line, all of those um, come under our division. We accredit them, but we also represent them and connect them. So to kind of find out where the gaps are mm -hmm. that people are seeing at the local level, especially now in today's climate with the pandemic, um, where can we serve and, and what gaps can we build to kind of fit that need? But then we also represent more of the, the day individualized, like the law survivors, the lived experience and attempt survivors, all of them uh, prevention experts from like the CDC, they all come together in the network that makes our organization. So I think one of the ways that we're involved is really number one, having the solid science and saying, here's what's going on. Unfortunately, if you look at science and you look at data and we're, we're two years behind, every time national data comes out, um, we don't have any real time data reporting, which is something we need to. That's something we're starting to work on now um, with Congress and some other bodies and saying, just like we have with COVID, uh, we need to have that for other issues as well. And what can we do? Um, specifically this week, what's been so busy is we've been busy with 988, which is the, the new National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number um, that's moving forward. So if there's one thing, and I know Chuck really knows as well, and he can kind of talk about this is, well, we can talk here about what we're failing to at, at the cultural level talking about this. Um, as we start changing society, as we start changing the ability to talk and feel comfortable about the issue, we're up against some pretty outdated structures to, that we'll need to fix, that we'll need to upgrade to be able to meet the need. Um, we found out just from 988, it's going to take two years. The bill passed, it's moving to the president's desk, um, but it's going to take two years for implementation. A lot of that is just, we need to get down to the state level we need to change systems and processes. So, I mean, it, it's it's something that we need to work on at all different levels. And Chuck, how are you interacting with, with the field in order to accelerate the kind of changes that uh, Colleen is, is pointing to? Yeah, and you know, I think as Maureen pointed out, it's really complex. You know, this is a perfect example of all healthcare being local. It's this interaction at the local level mm -hmm. between academic institutions and individual clinics. But what we try to do is to create opportunities for uh, best practices, emerging evidence to be shared with practitioners uh, through our conference, other kinds of educational offerings. Then we also offer things like um, learning communities to help organizations not just understand what the best practice is, but how do you actually implement it. Um, and then we actually, from time to time, we have projects. Uh, we have one going on right now. Uh, with schools of social work to help develop content that um, instructors, professors can then incorporate into their lessons as well as field instructors can use with students. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we've tried to approach that. One of the things that we're doing as an organization is we're trying to draw attention to the various dimensions of this. So we're, we're trying to be uh, to, to uh, take a productive role in either our uh, executive search work or the work that we're doing through our nonprofit to, to bring this information out. Uh, we did a profile of a whole bunch of uh, Maureen staff and board uh, uh, members, um, and we did a, we did a mashup uh, video which, which basically talked about what Palo Alto University uh, does. Uh, we've been covering LGBTQ plus uh, issues, people coming out of incarceration. We just had a, a discussion with the 100 Club, which, are, uh, which is a law enforcement uh, and first responders uh, support group for people who have uh, been killed in action, uh, as well as uh, people who have suffered various forms of trauma. Uh, so we're also trying, but it's, it's a tough topic to grapple with. There's so many different dimensions. Um, as, as we look at at uh, entering this, this next piece, there is a, another multiplier that I never thought we in America would have to deal with, and that is disinformation. This whole idea of confusion, of not knowing what the truth is, or questioning the truth of everything, questioning science. Uh, the scientists don't really know, and the politicians do, you know, those kinds of things. Um, how do you deal with, in an environment, where everything is being thrown up uh, for question, where divisions seem to be being driven um, by sowing doubt, and, and doubt becomes part of the, the, the traumatic experience. Colleen, could you, could you give a cut uh, on this one? Yeah, and I think a lot of where we see this intersecting is with studies. Like new data comes out and automatically it's not 
through or this is why and someone saw something online and this you know they found it on google and 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 the cdc report is is not valid or something like that so one of the things we have to be prepared with and that we've been working on is to have multiple data sets so every time there's a new study come prepared with here's every way or every other demographic that's impacted by that. So we deal a lot, for instance, right now, one of our hot issues is suicide by firearm. And the minute you talk about it, we just get blasted. Um, and so, you know, we, we've done a couple of webinars this week, we've done last week, and just the anger and vitriol that comes at us. And and that's when we get in, we're not getting into politics, we're getting into saving, saving human lives. Because if you look at the number of suicides, the majority of them are by gun. This is what we're talking about, here's the data. And we just keep it, a lot of times it's just come prepared with multiple um, levels of facts, multiple data sets, multiple studies, and just say, look at everything all together. Let's all clearly understand that we have a problem. Let's fix the problem. We're not gonna just dispute each other. Um, and so keep focused really on the main issue. And for us, it's preventing suicide and, and impacting the lives of those impacted by it. Isn't, isn't the, the number of, of, of suicides annually in the United States about 30,000 and about- two, More, two, that? 48, 48, every year we have more than 48,000 lives lost um, for suicide. So it's one pretty much every 11 minutes or so. And what, what percentage is by, by guns? It's just over 50%. So it's a little bit of a fraction over. So it's more than half. It's, so it's like 50.4. So, so the real question is, if, if you're going to have a discussion, if you can't start with facts, and they are statistics, right? They're, they're neutral. If you can't start with facts, uh, you end up in this cycle of argument, which in itself is trial because you can't do anything. And, and maybe uh, that's, that's part of the intent. Chuck is a national council that is dedicated to, um, to taking facts, sharing information, being an information clearinghouse, and helping people take action. How do you deal with this, with, with this confusion that is being sowed in, in the information ecosystem? Yeah, you know, I, maybe we would just use this example around means, uh, means restriction mm -hmm. and its relationship to suicide. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even in conservative states, if you present the data, you can actually get, you know, a good policy put in place. Mm -hmm. So that's not a question about you know, no one should have access to firearms, but it's a question of if you're in a place where you are at uh, increased risk for suicide, there could be temporary removal of your firearm. And, and we, you know, so I think, you know, why we're in a, a highly politicized and sometimes vitriolic environment, sometimes uh, data does win out and, and you can mm -hmm. have uh, these kind of victories. I would also go back, Mark, to you know, your opening statement when you talk about one in four people experience a mental illness every year. The other thing that we have going for us is most people, to Maureen's point, most people know someone who is struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think that also does make a difference. If we think about, I'm mean, going to just change topics a little bit, how much attention opioid overdose has gotten in this country? It's because almost everybody knows somebody who's either been had been affected by this and politicians every time they went home someone was talking to them about this and we need to just you know that that's a very important lesson uh for, for making kind of progress at a policy level my wife's, best, my wife's best friend in california uh killed herself with a firearm uh, not in a place where firearms are known to be plentiful or easily accessible. Uh, she did have access. Um, she also suffered from uh, bipolar disorder. Um, and so you have this, this situation where um, that, that point where you're saying that, that accessibility um, and the combination of, of a person's personal trauma uh, resulted in tragedy. Um, and we all know somebody who has uh, some something about their mental health situation that is of concern. That's how families operate. So maybe that whole idea of just empathetically connecting uh, mm -hmm. transcends the the data issue. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Maureen. I just wanted. No, no, no. I was I was just going to say that the you know there's a complexity that is really important to understand too. So there are the data that. Um, 
we want to be able to rely on their fact. We, we, it's surprising to those of us who are science scientists, you know, to 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 see things questioned that you know that are, that have been sort of long-standing uh, understandings. The on the other side, though, from a critical thinking standpoint, there are data data that have not been collected in a way that represent the full scope of the situation. Mm -hmm. or the problem is, Colleen was so you know rightly saying earlier. So when we talk about evidence-based practices that we all use in our in our work and we are very dedicated to that that work and that research, we are now also questioning, you know, how has that evidence been gained? Have the appropriate populations been included? What do we really know? What if what has been done in so I think it's what's hard for people is you have to hold both of those things at the same time. There are facts and science that we have to rely on. And then there are some things we have to question that we have held true. And so, you know, that's where we're working with our students all the time, right? To really be able to hold that kind of complexity. And so when I, when I hear people say, you know, well, we can just send students to coding school, they don't have to get a college education. You know, I just, <laughs> I freak out because yeah. in this day and age, you've mm -hmm. got to hold those things and be able to handle that. But, but no. I also think one of the things we're talking about here, central to everything is humanizing it. So bringing out the human is the main factor, you know, because data is one thing. And you're, you're saying too, do you know somebody or someone every time they went home the congressional representatives or um, you know presidential candidates they're hearing on the ground when they go are real stories real cases that's what's going to change um, and I think especially today when we live in a disconnected world um, we could debate uh, that's a whole other session we could debate you know social media and how we spend more of our time behind a screen than we do in person um, but kind of getting out and, and talking to one another again, I think is going to help this and realizing, you know, whether it's the grassroots level, one of the, one of the greatest things I love about being member based is that a lot of the great action is happening, whether it's our youth board, whether it's on the ground practices happening in the various states or communities or crisis centers, bringing more of those out and getting them connected. Um, and don't just rely on the national, don't just rely on the national org, don't just rely on um, the government to come out and say, this is what you need to do. Sometimes you know better in your own community. Um, so those that's kind of, that's my soapbox. <laughs> no, no, those lived experience boards. I think that's really becoming a very important. I really appreciate that. Well, I think what you're all saying is that it starts with talking to each other, yeah. right? It, it starts with sharing. Um, we were, we did a poll and, and um, I think that, that the group who, who is attending via Zoom uh, agrees, about 60% of people said the biggest issue that they find is uh, stigma still. And stigma can only be alle uh, alleviated by, um, by being open and being vulnerable and talking and, and then meeting people with empathy, right? Listening a little bit and learning from somebody's um, uh, views. And whether you're um, a soldier who has um, uh, uh, who is part of a culture where you uh, you try and, and tie yourself down and just move on, um, and that's necessary in a, in so many environments, um, or you're um, you're uh, uh, a civilian um, that is dealing with economic distress or, or some, uh, some sort of uh, mental uh, illness issue. Um, it really starts off by talking to somebody who will hear and who will listen and who will meet you halfway. Um, and that's so important. We also asked um, uh, about drivers of, of suicide. And we found that there are two major um, responses that, that uh, seem to gain traction. One is the whole idea of despair and isolation, feeling useless, inadequate, helpless. And the other piece um, people were talking about was uh, mental, mental illness. Let me ask you a question about mental illness. Are we all, is that sort of designation in itself a barrier? Aren't we all dealing with different aspects of that issue? Aren't we all in, in a certain respects uh, mentally ill, just as we all have physical attributes and ailments and pains and so on, um, isn't it? Isn't it all of us, as opposed to categorizing and therefore perhaps stigmatizing uh, certain people? Uh, Maureen, what what is the academic 
um, research say about that kind of an issue? Well, there's certainly some truth to what you're saying. Obviously, all of us, um, we move, right? You know, we have certain levels of, of mood, anxiety, you know, other kinds of things. But I, I don't think I want to get, you know, I don't totally want to accept that um, that there, there are certainly people for whom their level of distress requires intervention, right? right. And I, I think that's what, you know, that's sort of, you know, if you think of it on a, on a continuum, perhaps, you know, we don't want to just minimize the fact that we're all dealing with it and we just need to talk about it. I mean, there certainly are people who need stronger intervention and that's, you know, that's something that we pay a lot of attention to. But I think in general, you're right, there are, we're in fact, you know, the, you, you mentioned Dr. Munoz's work. Some of what we're looking at now is what could be online, evidence-based, online, self-paced interventions that for a lot of people would be enough, right. right? That's not, but then there's this, you know, there's a group of people who will need more than that. And so that I think getting clearer understanding of that and where to inter intersect the treatment and what level of treatment is what a lot of the work is now going on. So, Chuck, so Mark, I see you nodding. So, I'm well, going to throw it to you, and I'm going to wrap up with Colleen um, and, and yeah. give Colleen the last word. I would think about it like we all have blood pressure, but some of us have high blood pressure, right? And, and so it's the same kind of thing, right? All of us, you know, uh, you know, our mental wellness uh, is important, you know, to our functioning. And I think Maureen makes some really important points about what's the, you know, kind of the threshold, you know, to what degree is the whatever. Uh, uh, we're experiencing causing disruption in our lives, in inhibiting us being able to function or to uh, to do what we need to do. Uh, and that's, you know, when interventions, and again, I think, you know, the other point that Marie makes is, you know, trying to understand what's the right intervention. For a lot of people, it could be, it could be something uh, less intense or passive. And, and you know, we're, I think we're in an gr incredible opportunity right now with digital uh, interventions that won't replace uh, in person, but it will certainly complement and, and hopefully make care uh, more available. I just comment on the poll. You know, the poll that we took today is, is um, important, but if you look at every poll that's done, including most recently SAMHSA just published their national survey on drug use and health, um, there are usually three issues that come up. Uh, why people don't seek care. Stigma is only one of them. The other two that are right up there is, I don't think I can afford it. I don't know where I can go. And I don't mm -hmm. want us to lose that because, you know, because that's also a question about how do we have equity uh, and access, you know, in our healthcare system for people who do live with these illnesses and need treatment. Colleen, why don't you uh, <laughs> take us out with, with your, your most important uh, call to action for us all? Absolutely. I think one of the key things we can do is normalize that everybody's going to struggle at some point in their lives. So it's okay not to be okay. Um, the other thing that we say too is that suicide is, is everybody's business, which means you don't focus just on the individual, but that everybody has a role to play. So whether you're friends, family, know what to watch for, know how to have a conversation with someone about their mental health, and then know how to get them um, help when they need it. And I think the third point is that one of the things that we've been, we've been showing and proving is that it's not just the person that's broken. Because a lot of times the individual is called out and this person is not, um, like, like we're saying, not well or is the broken part. If only you change, then you can become um, you know, X, Y, or Z. And what we're saying, it's not the individual that's broken, it's actually the system that's broken. So I think whether it's at the federal level, whether it's the community level, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we're providing a system um, that can get adequate help for those who need it. We all, we all have a role to play. We all have a role to play. We all have, we all are in part the drivers of trauma and we can all be the healers of trauma. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, sharing the work uh, that you're doing. Colleen Creighton, CEO of the American Association of Suicidology. Uh, Chuck, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this again. Ngoglia, uh, President and CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health. I got it this time. And Maureen O'Connor, President of Palo Alto University. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you all for attending, and thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights on this important work.